As many of you know, the world's governments are in Bali this week trying to thrash out a successor to the Kyoto Treaty on Climate Change. And in fact, we're delighted to welcome one of the architects of the Kyoto Treaty, Dr. Bob Watson. He's a former chair of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which of course jointly won this year's Nobel Peace Prize along with Al Gore. And today, Dr. Watson is chief scientific advisor to the British Ministry that deals with agriculture and rural affairs. And one of his biggest headaches is advising on the fate of the UK's badger population. Dr. Watson is also chair of the International Agro Assessment, which next month, after four years of deliberations, will unveil a roadmap for an increase in global food that is both sustainable and equitable. And this time, not a badger in sight. Dr. Bob Watson, I presume. <laughs> Well, first, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here today. Today, the world faces many challenges, none more important than eliminating hunger, poverty, and environmental degradation. Over 400 experts from all around the world have been assessing how agricultural knowledge, science, and technology has contributed over the last 50 years to some of these development and sustainability challenges. And we've looked ahead another 50 years to ask how agriculture sector can contribute to reducing hunger, poverty, and doing it in a way that is both socially and environmentally sustainable. It's called the International Agricultural Assessment, and it will be produced in January next year. Today, 1.3 billion people live on less than $1 a day. 3 billion people live on less than $2 a day. 850 million people go to bed hungry every night. And around 2 billion people have no access to clean water, sanitation, or modern energy. We have a major challenge ahead, which I believe we can meet. We've had major successes in the agricultural sector. Food production is at an all-time high. Food prices, an all-time low. Less hungry people than ever before. But that success has come at a price. Unfortunately, the increased agricultural productivity has increased the emissions of greenhouse gases, leading to human-induced climate change. It's reduced biological diversity. It's led to land and water pollution in many parts of the world. And unfortunately, not everybody has benefited. We must recognize today that agriculture is more than simple production. It's all about environmental stewardship. It is central that we protect the natural resource base that underpins our agricultural sector. And therefore what we need are agroecological strategies to meet this challenge, including organic farming. Economic growth, population growth, will lead to an increased demand for food and it will demand increased food quality. Unfortunately, this increased production demand comes at a time of less water available to the agricultural sector, less arable land, less labour due to rural migration to the urban centres, endemic diseases like malaria, HIV AIDS. There are land tenure disputes. There's more demand for biological processes for bioenergy. And of course, climate change that threatens the environment around the world, development, and national and regional security. All of these threats mean that we meet the challenge of more food in a way that stimulates science and technology. Progress will not be achieved unless we develop more agroecological approaches, as I said earlier, redirect our AKST, Agricultural Knowledge, Science and Technology, to the needs of the poorest of the poor and the disenfranchised, we need to recognise the critical role of women and empower women to play their role. We can only be successful by combining advances in science and technology from universities and government labs with the innate knowledge, the traditional knowledge of the local farmer. Many of the challenges we face today can be successfully addressed with biotechnology, nanotechnology, remote sensing, 
information and communication technology, but only if we use it in new and innovative ways with that local and traditional knowledge embedded in the farmers in both developed and developing countries. But there are some challenges such as climate change, vaccines for animal diseases, the next generation of bioenergy that is both socially acceptable and environmentally successful. These will need further advances in science and technology, knowledge we do not have today. We need to target small farmers. We need participatory research where the desires and the needs of the poor farmers are recognised. We need university scientists to work hand in hand with farmers. We need to stimulate innovation at the farm level. We need to reduce post-harvest loss of food, which is completely wasted. Public policies are needed. Education is critical. International agreements and trade reform, absolutely central to this agenda. While international markets are critically, depend critically important, there is a need to ensure that we have the national institutions in place, the infra infrastructure in place, to make sure that the poorest of the poor benefit from these international markets. Today, few do. We need to increase our investments in research and development, both in the public and in the private sector. The private sector is becoming incredibly important in these development and sustainability challenges, but most of their research today goes into the markets of the industrialised world. We need them to invest in developing countries. We need to increase our investments in education. Lastly, it's clear that business as usual, unfortunately, will not eliminate poverty and hunger. Will only lead to further changes in climate, will only lead to further losses in biodiversity, will only lead to further degradation of our land and pollution of our waters. We need to create space for diverse views and perspectives. The future is not preordained. Working together, farmers, local communities, the private sector, local and national governments, we can achieve the vision of sustainable world. Communicating these challenges to civil society is critically important, as is empowering the entrepreneurship of both citizens and the private sector. Together, we can leave our children and grandchildren a vibrant, equitable, and sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Bob Watson. I like the bit about the empowerment of women, incidentally. <laughs> Highlight. <laughs>